Ian Michelle, yeah. welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. Excited to be here, Ethan. Uh, I've been listening to you for a while now and um, actually pretty recently listening to your podcast, but I've seen you around the gym for a long time now. Yeah. 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 You, you were one of the guys, you know, there's, there's like people that you know you see in the gym and you're like, that guy's in my tribe. And I, I, I spotted you in, and was like, oh, that guy and I, we, we have some ideas that are aligned. More aligned than I'd imagined. Um, I've been working as a trainer and a nutritionist in the city for a little over a decade now. And there's a lot of stuff that I've incorporated in my practice, especially over the last about half a decade. And when I saw you in the gym, because working downtown, you see famous people all the time. You work around them constantly, celebrity trainers, musicians, what have you. And I was like, he worked with Jared Feather. <laughs> he goes, he works out of the same playbook that I do with all my clients. This is super cool. And I think you were on an elliptical machine or something. I came up and fanboy you immediately, but not for any of your movie stuff. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was like, you know, you know the secret sauce. You know the secret sauce. And and it is good. And it's improving every year. Let me ask you this. Prior to you starting to implement that sciencey stuff, what were you doing? Well, so what was your I, evolution? So I have been an athlete since I was six and I've worked with trainers and nutritionists since I was about 12. That's when I started lifting weights. And the first weightlifting coach I had was a bodybuilding coach. Actually, he's a guy named Guy Del Corso. He's a great guy, owned a gym in Hawthorne, New Jersey. And he's one of the head expediters at for the NPC and the IFBB. I compete in the NPC as a classic physique athlete. And he would just write a diet for me, he just on a piece of paper, go eat this and nothing else. Right. And, and do a lot of cardio and lift your weights. And um, when I started out with my clients, it wasn't really that much different from that. Yeah. And was the diet tailored to them or was it really just stay away from these types of foods, eat six ounces of chicken and broccoli? Like, well, essentially it was, you know, I would go online and they had these basic, um, like the Mifflin St. Gior formula go on there. They're working out roughly this much, you know, they look like they're roughly this much body fat at this weight, this age, this sex. And I would get out my little calculator. It was still on my phone at the time, you know, kind of guesstimate how many calories they need and back in the macros. And then I would give them a very simple menu to eat from. Right. And it would just be eat this every day. Let's weigh in once a week when you come to the gym, you know, when you're at goal, the diet's over. Yeah. That was it. And um, it didn't work really well. <laughs> It was, not, it was not a recipe for success. And it was very frustrating because um, it had always worked for me True. as a psychotic athlete. Right. No, I but you know, I've, I've had this thing even with doctors where, because I, I feel fairly confident in looking at people and, and, you know, knowing whether they're above 20 or even 30% body fat or below. Yeah. And I go like, I can guesstimate that. But I had an instance where I was in a, a, a maniac cardio guy years ago. And I, and I mean, truly eight hours a day, six days a week of cardio on a bicycle. That doesn't leave room for anything else. No, no, there was no weightlifting. There was very little hanging out with my family. By the time I'd get home every night, I was exhausted. And I remember thinking like, what weight do I want to get to? Cause I'm starving myself while I'm doing this. And I just don't know what a good weight is. I was 240 at the time. So I go to the best sports medicine doctor, a guy named Heizenga. And in my head, I'm thinking I probably need to lose 20 pounds. And so I have this consult with him and he's like 20 pounds. No, 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 you need to lose like 60 pounds. And we're going to do a DEXA scan on you right now. And we're going to figure out exactly how much do you lose, but it's closer to 60. And I'm fucking devastated. I do the DEXA scan. He comes back with the results. He says, you have to do a DEXA scan again, go and do another one. It's in his office. He's a very fancy doctor. Do another DEXA scan comes back in and goes, I had to recheck it. You don't need to lose any weight. You're 12% body fat at 240 pounds. You're done. 
And to this, yeah. I thought in my head, no, I need to lose 20 pounds. Like it didn't matter what he said one way or the other. I wanted to lose 20 pounds, but he was the first guy who was like, how about some resistance training? How about not all cardio, which was a good idea. But to your point of like, just eyeballing people, it's not always easy to tell. No, it's not. And also, I mean, I have a thing where with myself, I'm incredibly sodium sensitive. So, I mean, just over Thanksgiving, you know, getting off my regular, and I'm bulking right now. I'm, I'm, I'm big. I mean, if you see photos of me when I'm in contest shape, I'm, I'm like 40 pounds lighter. Right. Um, so I'm all blown up like a water balloon right now. And you don't know, you know, people can be eating healthfully, but just have one meal out or have a bad night of sleep. And it's just sort of like, well, where are all their abs going? Why do they look like they, they're a chipmunk right now? You know, it's just. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or like, you, you know, a lot of people, uh, when they decide to diet, they go off of carbs and that can just change. Like your muscles deflate yeah. and, and yeah. you could look just completely different. You actually could look like you have less muscle mass just by not eating carbs. And actually on a DEXA scan, as far as I know, you would actually show up as having less muscle mass. Yeah. It doesn't differentiate between the glycogen and the water stored inside of a muscle and the dry weight of the muscle itself, which is interesting where they do some of these studies where people that are going through a diet and they show significant muscle loss at the end of the diet. And, you know, I'd be curious to see what would happen if they would just refeed them for a couple of weeks. I did. I did with uh, Jared, actually, and he got really pissed at me because he, <laughs> he, he was like when I told him what happened, he was like, man if you had told me you were going to do that, we would have done this all different. But I did basically a DEXA scan at the end of um, a water, uh, what's it called? Oh Something. yeah, like no, no, no. When you're, when you're purging your system of, so yeah. you do high water for like five days and then you basically yeah. dehydrate yourself to get as yeah. lean And you probably possible. cut carbs too, right? I cut like everything. I wanted to be as lean as possible going into the DEXA scan. And it actually showed like a 7% increase in body fat because my muscle disappeared. I did the same thing. Jared was uh, peaking me for the NPC universe this year. He did an amazing job. It was, was the awesome. highest placing I ever had. I was like fourth in men's 35 uh, and over, um, which for me is like, you know, I've been competing for five years. That's like, that was, that was a really great showing. I looked ripped. And I went in for a DEXA scan at the end of that depletion phase and you know <laughs> it showed that i'd put on like five percent body fat and lost significant muscle i was like oh um, what's happened ooh, here yeah what, what happened here i was really confused about that and i hadn't looked into you know that the scan doesn't partition that out so for anyone going to get your dexa scan at the end of a diet refeed for a couple of weeks first yeah so and hydrate don't mm -hmm. yeah don't be at your absolute fucking leanest i, I mean actually yeah. Or there's a way to do that, but you got to refeed. You got to fill your muscles up. I was listening to the interview you had with uh, Dr. Nadolsky. You had a couple of him with him. And you guys were talking about uh, trisipatide, semaglutide, and they were doing DEXA scans on people and showing significant muscle loss, even with, I think it was even with resistance training. And, you know, my thought when I was listening to that was, I wonder when they're doing the scan, are they still calorie restricting? And inherently, you're going to eat less carbohydrate anyway if you're just eating less, right? And I'd just be interested to know what those scans would show if, you know, they were eating a little bit more for a little bit while for for a little while first. Yeah, the 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 muscle loss is so you know, look, I've I've seen uh, crazy changes on a DEXA on a DEXA scan with very little change to me physically, but doing stuff like purging my system of glycogen and water and that can make a huge difference um i've also seen long-term uh kind of lean tissue wasting on certain diets even on keto which i when i was doing keto for years and the only way to lose weight for me eventually on keto was to also be starving but i was losing weight I would yeah. have in my head, but I'm eating enough protein because the majority of the food I'm eating is meat. Um, I still saw consistently a 40%. But basically, yeah. if you're losing weight quickly, 
it's yeah. kind of impossible to not lose some lean tissue. So we, so you have bodybuilders who lose weight very, very slowly. And that's kind of, from what I've gleaned, the only way to like mitigate lean tissue loss. Yeah, especially if you are just, um, let's just say regular Joe on the street, not enhanced. Because right. there's definitely... You know, if you're seeing guys that are competing on the Olympia stage, professional bodybuilders, guys that are trying to become professional, for the most part, they're able to do some things that are going to allow them to go a lot harder um, and preserve muscle mass and in some instances even put on some. But for regular folks, for I would say almost 100% of my clients, um, they're not getting any help except from food, sleep, trying to reduce stress and pumping iron. Yeah, um, I would say the other big one um, that really, for me, was a watershed moment was giving up cardio to lose weight. I know you talk about doing eight hours a day, moving to just a, a step tracker. Yeah, mind blowing. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I when I, I'm in Florida right now, when I'm here, if I don't force myself to do cardio my steps disappear like i you know i have this like i spent so much of my life um you know with almost the immediate calculation with everything was how to avoid effort how to reduce movement because it was so exhausting you know like how to avoid stairs how to park close how to like uh, do i have to go to the bathroom no i'll wait until i really have to go to the bathroom because walking to the bathroom is exhausting like all yeah. of those things. So, so coming into a state where I'm like, I need to move more. I have to force myself to do that. It's completely not innate to me. And you have to so drive everywhere. I have to drive everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I need to make myself walk, park further away, look for instances where I can take the stairs. The step tracker is so great. I just use my phone and I don't, I don't look at the calories in my phone at all. Like those don't play a role in how I eat at all. But I do know that like when I'm in New York, I don't have to worry about cardio. I really don't because I'm walking wow. minimally 10,000, like 10,000 steps in New York is a, is easily is an, is an, a light day where I didn't do much, but like, I think I average about 20,000. Right. It's but if, I, <laughs> if I'm in LA or Florida, they just disappear. It goes down to 2000. Like I can't. So then I go like, I have to go do something where I'm moving and that, you know, it gets hot here sometimes and, you know, I, I, I get on the elliptical machine and, and get it in that way. I honestly dread having to go back to doing formal cardio to get ready for a competition so much. I think I would live in New York City until the end of my competitive career, even if there were better opportunities for me business-wise somewhere else, just because it's so much easier to cut weight when you can just walk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. The, I mean, just between high school wrestling, college wrestling, um, and up to just up to two years ago, I was still using the elliptical and the stair climber. One competition I even did, I even did fucking hit training to cut weight. Really? Not my best look. Probably one of the worst times in my life. I was not fun to work with or be around. <laughs> Tried it yeah. once, never will do it again. Never I, great I, to get I, in shape as a fighter, but not as a bodybuilder. Right. Yeah. But it's different. It, like I, I respect fighters so much, but that is a different beast than what the average Joe needs and wants out of their body. Yeah. It's not the same thing. And also thinking about what the average Joe needs and wants out of their body. Um, a big reason I got into, I guess you call it physique coaching, but it's mostly, mostly been weight loss coaching throughout my career is when I started it, I'd been an athlete for so long and had been so dinged up, had a couple of surgeries, broken bones, you know, my, my left knee still creaks pretty badly from wrestling. And when I started this career, I was looking around, <clears throat> I started Equinox a little over 10 years ago and everyone was trying to turn like lawyers and doctors into like athletes. Right. And I was looking around like, what, what the shit is this? Like, this is so fucking stupid. You guys. <laughs> You guys all need to lose about 20 or 30 pounds, get like a better blood test at your doctor and just feel okay. There's like, there's a much easier way to do that. I don't know why everyone has to do snatches and hang cleans. I mean, we did that, you know, when I was wrestling down at Penn and it, you know, it makes you a, a great wrestler. It can make you a great fighter, you know, um, 
but like I, I just didn't, couldn't understand why everyone was making everybody do these things you know yeah. especially when they hadn't ever been an athlete you know right. um and they're fun. I mean, if you want to enjoy CrossFit and you love the community of that or what, or where you're getting ready for something, um, I understand that, but it was just sort of like, um, what's the best way to describe it? If you were hiring a trainer, that's what you were getting. Yeah. I, I was like, I don't, I don't see the point in that for 90% of people. Yeah, no, I, I, I got into CrossFit for a minute many years ago and just got injured out of it. You know, yeah. I mean, I'm an old man who, never who who was carrying around a lot of excess weight for many years that does some damage to joints you know like my feet are not great my knees are not great and box jumps are just not in the cards for me they're just never not gonna be the, either yeah it's not something <laughs> i have any business doing and that's okay you know yeah. i also i also um you know, I, 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 I want to be able to run a 5k. I don't know that I'll ever run a 5k that isn't kind of damaging to my body, you know, and that's okay too. Yeah. And I think that really comes down to like, you know, <clears throat> want and need. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, you, you want to have clients who um, are in the middle of a weight cut. And then say, oh, I'd like to just jump in and start prepping for this marathon. And I'll be like, yeah. do, do you need to do that while we're right. trying to lose 20 pounds? Because that's like kind of a terrible idea. Yeah. Maybe maybe wait till after and do the next marathon. Feel a whole lot better. So when did you shift? What was your what was the moment for you where you shifted into this kind of design? Um, so I was recertifying, actually. And every couple of years, if you want to keep your certifications current, um, I'm a certified sports nutrition specialist and a certified personal trainer through NCSF. And every two years, you have to get continuing education. And I've been reading a whole lot of books on bodybuilding. It's mostly written by different gurus. You know, there's Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding and all these different books. And I was going through the credit library in my certification, and there was a book a textbook by Dr. Brad Schoenfeld, who's a professor at Lehman College up in the Bronx, and one of the sort of the preeminent researchers alive right now in muscle hypertrophy, fat loss, that kind of thing. And it was, you know, um, science and development of mus muscular hypertrophy. And I read this thing, and I was like, oh my God, people are doing really good research on this. Like, there's stuff we actually know. We can We can be more efficient. Like, it's not just try this workout from this Mr. Olympia type of deal, which I'd done over the years. And there was efficacy in all of them. Um, but that really got me started down the path. And then I looked him up and then I found Renaissance periodization. Dr. Isratel online started listening to his talks, uh, read through their eBooks. And um, that was kind of the big shift for me. And I'd always hired coaches even while I was coaching other people. And then I started to listen to some of the things that they were saying and I was like, God, this, this stuff doesn't really seem to make sense. And, you know, it was about three years ago for my own competitive career where I finally said, you know what, I'm just not going to listen to my coach anymore. I'm going to use the principles I've been using now with my clients for a couple of years. It seemed to be doing a really good thing for them. And I'm going to start applying that to my own physique and my own programming and my own diet. And I was like, holy shit, I'm like winning contests all of a sudden. And now I'm not just, you know, I'm qualifying for nationals and, oh my God, I'm in first call out to nationals and what, what the hell? And I'm not hurt all the time. Like, and, and dieting is easier. I was like, this is, this is really great stuff. Not just for a regular Joe on the street, but for, you know, a very competitive nationally ranked athlete. Um, and also I saw that my clients were, it went from like 10% of people who had a lot of grit could lose weight and hold it off and it took it to a coin flip right i was like wow now about half the people that walk in the door i can actually help them yeah and I, was, I was just blown away by that you know and they can keep it off i was like whoa this is this is some really good stuff do you think the the drugs we brought up some some semaglutide or semiglutide and trisepatide do you think those will be a net positive or negative to your business? 
So I think it, it opens the door for guys like me to be way more useful. Mm -hmm. So as for instance, my father um, ate his way into type two diabetes and he has been treated with semaglutide um, for the last year and a half. And he's steadily losing weight. He refuses to lift weights. He walks a little bit more than usual, but all of his blood tests are getting better. Mm -hmm. Pretty much just portion controls, you know. Um, but, you know, for people that, so there are some clients that are almost impossible to reach. Um, some people come in the door with real binge eating disorders, like really hardcore, difficult issues. And for them, it doesn't really matter how you coach them. Like, like they're, they're just fighting something that you can't help them with. Yeah. You know, I'm not professionally equipped to help them with. And especially for folks like that, um, I had one client. But I, I even think yeah. not, not to, to your point, like I'm not professionally equipped to help them with that. I think even the professionals who are quote unquote equipped to help them with that, it's not even a coin toss. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you're it, not tough. getting great. There aren't. Listen, if fucking keto came along and solved all of this, then there wouldn't be a problem anymore. The problem has done nothing but get worse with every iteration of fad diet we've had. You know what I mean? So to those yeah. people who I consider myself one of, it does seem like the professionals never really – it is hard to get through to somebody who can't even communicate what they're dealing with. So I can say this. Um I am a recovered alcoholic and drug addict. And for me, not drinking and not doing drugs, just that alone opened the door for me to start working on deeper issues and, and get better and recover from the issues that were causing me to need to drink and do drugs to feel okay inside my own head, right? And I will most likely, almost definitely require a lifetime of help and constant work on that to enjoy a life of not drinking and doing drugs, right? And I'm okay with that because I'm, you know, I, I had some years of not drinking and doing drugs in my 20s where I was miserable without treatment and then went back to it. So for someone who is really, really struggling with binge eating and overeating at a level that's almost, I'm gonna say pathological because it's putting them into a disease state. I think that it's much more insidious to deal with than just drinking or doing drugs because you can't just put the plug in the jug. You have to eat every day. Yeah. Right. And so every single meal is potentially problematic. It's like saying, Ian, um, you can stay sober for the rest of your life, but you have to have four ounces of whiskey every day. Right. But that's it. But, but you have to have that every day. Not enough to get you where you need to go. But right. Like to, this is just enough to piss you off. off. <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly. And keep the craving going. Right. right. So we're going to stoke that fire every day and make you really uncomfortable, but you can't have more. And that's, that's the ticket for you. That isn't going to work. So I think that drugs like this open the door for people to get to have at least somewhat of an experience of what it's like to slay that dragon a little bit. You know, I know Dr. Nadolsky, a big thing they talk about now is food noise. Yeah. If you can just dial that down so that every meal doesn't become that shot of whiskey that's potentially going to send you over the edge and can just make it a glass of milk. If a meal just becomes a meal, at least hunger wise, and it doesn't just light up the pleasure centers in your brain or become that thing that can help you deal with depression and anxiety and whatever you're dealing with with that. I think that's a net positive for everybody. But I do think there's going to be an adjustment period where people have to figure out how best to utilize that, you know? Um, I looked at some of the projections for some of these drugs, um, and I think it was Wegovi is projected to have an 11,000% increase in the next four years. 11,000%. And for me, like, look, Cocaine was developed as a, a, a numbing agent. It, it was, it's a, it, you know, it's um, to desensitize nerve endings. Basically, they, you go get a nerve, uh, get your deviated septum repaired. They're packing your nose with cocaine before they work on it. Like that's what it's for. It's medical. Yeah. 
the, I would I would posit that the majority of cocaine use in America is probably not being delivered by ENT surgeons. That's M most likely suspicion. not. Right. Most likely not. So with anything, I go like, OK, 11,000 percent. It could turn the food noise off for all these people. I don't know why McDonald's isn't heavily lobbying against this drug, to be honest with you. Maybe they are. We don't know. Maybe every time you read a headline where it's like so-and-so had a bowel obstruction due to Ozempic, <laughs> it's McDonald's <laughs> planting a story, right? Because they're yeah. probably scared as shit that they're going to start losing money. Or they yeah. just... You know, they just make everything slightly more expensive and people start eating normal size meat. Like they get rid of the super size me thing, right? They don't give that food away anymore. And, you know, uh, I'm not worried about McDonald's. I, I think they're going to be OK. Otherwise. And if they're not OK, OK. Right. <laughs> Fine know, with me. I'm not going to cry if Jack Daniels goes under either. I mean, it's it's not going to change my day. Yeah. What I will say is this. There are going to be downsides to everything but i think when you are faced with a problem as big as we're dealing with now in the united states and globally where people just can't stop the food is too good it's too plentiful it's too available the marketing is too strong socially everything is wrapped around food um how do you even fight back against that you know, it's yeah. like the ultimate peer pressure and it's delicious and it's available and no one's telling, you no. Right. You know, I think that um, I think it's an unfair fight. And that's why most people, you know, statistically, most people are losing it. It's not a fair fight, you know. Yeah. So hopefully things like this and as they begin to improve, level the playing field and give people a chance. You know, because um, it causes a lot of suffering, not just medically, emotionally. Yeah. You have feel like you have a loss of efficacy. You don't feel very good about yourself. You know, no matter what people say on social media, you know, I sit down with folks when they come to me with, you know, my partner, Becky, when they have a real problem in their life. Like, I just don't want to feel this way anymore. It's not even, I don't like the way I look. It's just, I don't like the way I feel. I feel unhealthy. I'm tired. I'm anxious. You know, this is, this isn't working for me as a lifestyle choice. I want to make it stop. How do we make it stop? Yeah. Yeah, it it it's there are some deeper things too. Like I I had that feeling uh many times. I woke up many mornings going I'm I have to change and the kind of the loudest voices over and over again very consistently were fad diets. This will this will achieve change for you, right? And so I would just link on to that and there would be no deeper change my hope and again my hope for cocaine would be that it's all employed by ENTs fixing noses but i can't control yeah. that my hope for these drugs would be that people you know combine them with a little resistance training a, a, or exercise of any kind and uh and a better overall diet but i but i would be willing to bet there will be a lot of people that just are eating less at mcdonald's yeah. And also, I do think there is a bit of um, a slightly deeper issue that goes on with a lot of folks. Very often, forget how delicious the food is, forget, you know, the difficulty of getting in and working out and the big hassle behind making time in your day. Very often, we're just treating something else that's going on. You know, and just at least for me, I know just um, work has gotten really busy over the last couple of months. I haven't been able to go and do what I normally do as often to go take care of my alcoholism and I haven't been feeling as well. And I have a coach and I'm supposed to be bulking right now and I'm only supposed to be bulking like a little bit, like a little bit. I'm more of an advanced bodybuilder. And if anyone knows this, the more advanced you are, the less you can get from any individual bout of training and you have to overeat less, the bigger you get. And I've been eating like an asshole, honestly. Um, and, and I can tell you, if I'm not taking care of myself emotionally, I'm like, like an asshole. And I've yeah. been doing this a long time. I'm really good at dieting. If you go on my Instagram and see me in contest shape, I'm good at it. And I'll do it again and again and again. But if I'm off the beam emotionally, even me, I'll be up at 2 a.m. eating all the cheese out of the fridge. I've got some like cheese for our dog in the fridge last night to like help him eat some medication. I ate all of it. My wife was up in the morning. She's like, hey, did you eat all the dog cheese? And I was like, 
you know, when you put it that way, that sounds really bad. Like, right. <laughs> it was just cheese when I was eating it. I don't care what you bought it for. When you put it that way, now I'm ashamed. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, I, for, I did, um, you know, I maintained my weight for five years. And I, and in that, That's time, amazing. in that time, I've gotten really lean for a photo, but like, I got that lean. And of course, the day that I was my absolute leanest, I was like, yeah, this is, I'm going to stay like this. N no such luck. I think I gained nine pounds before the photo shoot was done, um, yeah. which was super disappointing. But then I was like, no, no, I have been miserable dieting down to this. I'm, this is not a way to live. I'm not going to maintain this. So I got back to my maintenance weight and then I did a massing phase and I got to be honest. Um, it's just not, I'm not a bodybuilder. I, I do like to work out like a bodybuilder, but I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm not ever going to be a bodybuilder. And so massing for me is out of the cards. It's just not because, you know, that was my thing. Overeating was my thing since I was five years old. Intentionally doing that was super mentally unhealthy for me. Yeah, I think so. The idea of massing and cutting Technically speaking, it is the most efficient way to put on muscle if it's done responsibly. As many top bodybuilders as I've ever spoken to, myself included, I wouldn't consider myself a top bodybuilder. I'm a hobbyist. Uh, it costs me money. No one pays me. And mostly what I get from it is exhaustion and I learn good lessons that I then try to help my regular clients with. Um, I think for the most part, I've never met a bodybuilder who was perfect sticking to these modern protocols that we have. Everyone overeats too hard in the yeah. off season, you know, cause we're starving our asses off the other half of the year. And, you know, for most of my clients, almost everybody, it doesn't make sense to do that. You know, if someone comes to me obese, medically overweight, and we spend a year to two, sometimes three years getting them down to a healthy weight. We're at goal. We're, we're never, we're at maintenance. And then the tough job, and this is really tough, is how do we stay comfortably at a healthy weight permanently? Yeah. The, the recidivism is unbelievable. It is so hard to do that. So to then go to somebody and say, okay, now let's purposefully overeat and then have to diet again. Oh, and by the way, we're going to do that like 10 times. Like, right. By no, the way, no. for us, for us guys like that, maintenance is a lot of work. Maintenance is a diet. Like oh, in, yeah. bo in both senses of the word, it is restrictive. It isn't, you know, this is, was my big oh, yeah. misunderstanding at first when I, when I kind of ventured into this and I, and I actually think it was, um, uh, it, it happened earlier with even with like Tim Ferriss, the four hour body where I was like, oh, I got a cheat day. I will destroy the entire week's work in a day. Oh, yeah. No problem. Oh, you know, yeah. I mean, so, I've done the math. I can eat like 8000 calories in a day. If I do it like, you know, on junk food, I can just blow pie that like no problem. It's yeah. not hard. Yeah. Not hard. Not hard. <laughs> and, and so when I first heard about diet breaks. I was like, no, that's not, that's going to be completely destructive. But it, the, the thing to communicate to people is no, no, no. It's a lot of work. It's, it's actually more work and it's more about how you're going to live your life for the rest of your life once dieting's done. So I think that this is, there's a bit of a misnomer there. When we talk about maintenance phases, when we talk about dieting breaks, I used to tell people, this is the time where we can start to incorporate more junk food, we can loosen up a little bit on our restrictions. I've, I've kind of changed my wording there a little bit over the years. I now tell people, okay, so when we're done with the calorie restricting phase, we're then heading into the most difficult phase, <laughs> the most critical phase. This is one where I fail myself. I, I'm so bad at doing maintenance. I'm great at overeating. I'm great at dieting. I'm not good at maintenance, especially as a competitor. I'm always seeking more gains. I want to be ripped or I want to get more jacked immediately. And that's not even the way to go for us, right? Um, but for regular folks, um, I started having more success when I put more emphasis on the maintenance phases as like the critical time to really buckle down and really pay attention. I said, this is us learning how to live a way that you've never lived before for most folks. You know, 
you, most people come to me, oh, I've dieted so many times successfully and lost 30 or 40 pounds or whatever. Like, okay, great. So you're already good at that. Right. You're already great at that. You're already a pro. I'm just going to try and pump the brakes a little bit and help you do it a little bit more responsibly. And then I'm going to tell you to stop probably before you want to. And then we're going to try something really novel that you suck at. <laughs> right. And and this is the thing that you fail 100% of the time. And very often me too, we're great at getting shredded and we're great at getting fat. How do we just... Yeah, it's the hardest and, thing. I'd say that as far as um, the way that I do my coaching, the way that Becky does her coaching, the way that most coaches that are at least evidence-based now trying to help people maintain a healthy weight is the toughest part. Getting people to lose weight, getting people to bulk, that's not nearly as challenging. How do we get someone into that where you are now? Yeah, we're in a we're, good, we're, good place. Everything else, it's 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 a short term thing. Like I can do this. Like you tell me this is what it is for three months. I'm going to figure that out and fucking life's going to suck for three months, but I'm going to You'll get spend eight hours doing cardio. Yeah. <laughs> but then I need the brakes to come off and I need that freedom because that's how I'm psyching myself up that this is going to end the fucking maintenance, which is work, which isn't innate, which it takes a lot of effort is the forever portion. That's the part that this, oh no, this isn't just for three months. This isn't yeah. just for today. This is yeah. how you have to live forever if you expect yeah. to hold on to these results. That's why I find also it's, um, it can be a bit of a tough sell trying to be a responsible communicator. Um, because that doesn't, you know, like if I go on your podcast or I go on Instagram or YouTube and say, hey guys, we're going to lose a lot of weight in 20 days and we're going to have this challenge. And we'll see how much weight you can get off. People sign up for that very quickly, you know, yeah. but what if I come on and say, Hey, I've got this plan where it's going to take you over a year to lose the weight that you normally lose in three months. And we're going to take some breaks, which are going to be miserable. And um, we're going to get you looking not like a cover model. You're just going to be healthy and, um, then you're going to have to try and maintain that until you die, hopefully 10 years later than you would have given your current circumstances. And you're going to, you're going to pay me for at least a couple of years to get you your result. How's that sound? You want to sign up now? How's that, that good for you? That good, that's good for me. Right. <laughs> let's, get, let's get middle-class slowly. Especially yeah, when you got 75 hard, like a trainer who's like, I'll change your life. It's like, look, I don't, I like 75 hard. 75 hard is like you're reading every day, you're doing shit outside, you're working out, you're eating in a specific way. But like what happens on 76? What are we doing? What dominoes? Yeah, exactly. Like we <laughs> I'm I'm trying to figure out 10 years from now and 20 years from now and like it was a revelation to me that I ditched the idea of there ever being an end to this, that it is yeah, forever. It's There's like no when end. I started using Rogaine, it's forever, but I get to keep this. Which is kind of cool. right. really I gave up on that too. I just yeah. wasn't, I, I wasn't diligent enough with it. I'm, I'm going to be 40 next year. And I always had this thing. I was like, I don't mind being totally bald. That's fine. I can deal with that. Just not in my thirties. Right. Just give me till 40 and then it's fine. Then it can all go. And then I'll just keep my abs and it'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> as long as you keep the abs, it doesn't matter what we got on top of we'll You can always grow a beard. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so with your clients, because I've I've had trainers before in the past where it's like, I mean, I had one guy who everybody who went to him, he put us on the exact same plan. And it was like the only form of carbs you get is berries. You're eating a lot of lean protein and vegetables. Those are free. And if you, if you have a very small handful of berries every day, so everybody does this and everybody yeah. works out exactly the same. And I remember at a certain point going like, this can't be right. This can't be right that it's one size fits all. Any man works out exactly like every other man. When you are dealing with your clients, how specific to each one of them are you? So, you know, I'm not a creative guy. I just try and go by the book. And so generally the way that we work it is that you find out, okay, what can they actually do right? reasonably? If we're talking about lifting weights, right? Someone could maybe only do 
two days a week. Maybe that's it for the rest of their life. Well, then that's going to have to be enough. You know, some people can do more. And actually, lifting two days a week is actually really good. If you can just do total body two days a week, you can be very, very strong, very healthy. Um, you know, when we're talking about doing four, five, six days a week, we're talking more about like major physique modification. Most people, three days a week max is all they're ever going to need for their entire life and get incredible benefit from it. When it comes to dieting, we do a diary. You know, um, I like my fitness pal. There are other amazing apps out there, but we just have them to the best of their ability record what they're doing for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I just say, look, we're just going to do a little inventory here to try not to change anything. Generally, once people start to take a look, actually take a look and see what they're doing, they downregulate fast. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. I was like, no, 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 man. If you drink 10 beers on a Friday night, I want I want to see those beers. And not in a judgy way. Like, I want you to see it, too. Yeah. You know, and then, and then we sit down and say, okay, well, this is what's actually going on. You know? Um, you're eating about this much. You're, I generally try to have people weigh in at least a few days a week so we can get an idea of whether this is causing them to gain weight, stay the same, drop weight, that kind of thing, because we're in the business of... I want to say weight loss, but tissue loss. And that's kind of a good barometer for that over time. You know, basically, if you take like a two week average of someone's weight, generally it gives you a good idea of really what's going on. And then we say, okay, um, it's all pizza and soda and beer. <laughs> you know, sometimes, not all the time. So we say, okay, so um, what's some sort of low hanging fruit initially that we can pluck out of here to make that, you know, it's kind of painless for you? that could get some calories out of the diet. And generally it's sort of like, you know, how do we get some protein in there? Right. You know, cause if we're trying to lift weights and maintain muscle mass, at least somewhat while we're trying to predominantly lose fat, you want to get enough protein in your diet. And it, generally it's amazing to me just how much people love chicken and steak, or at least they say that they do. And then there's just nothing in there. It's just yeah. all sugar and fat. So, and it can be difficult sometimes to get people to incorporate protein into a diet, even just at a minimal level. So, that's pretty much it at first. And everyone has different capacity. Some people can make big changes very quickly with their diet. Some people can get down with food prep, no problem. That is to say batch cooking like one or two days a week. So things are in the fridge and pre-measured and all this. Um, but for most folks that come to us that are lifelong, very heavy, never really took the junk food out of their diet at any point. It was more like restricting junk food. Oftentimes there's kind of a cleanup phase yeah. and I hate to use the word cleanup because there's no dirty food. There's like, I don't think I don't have any sort of moral attachment to the clean, dirty foods, whatever, but it's like, okay, instead of thinking about reducing food intake initially, can we get in more good things on average? Sometimes it can take six months. I've, I've worked with some people where it took almost a year of slowly just incorporating more healthy foods on average and slowly bringing out foods that, I guess I'm, I don't even say, you know, unhealthy, but very delicious, not very filling, tons of calories, Yeah, you know, and, and then start to work on things like portion control of those things. But invariably, when you take out all the pizza and the soda and the beer and you start to put in more fruits and vegetables, you start to put in more complex carbohydrates, more whole grains, things like that. When you start to switch from regular soda to diet where you start to drink to, you know, switch to water, or black coffee or tea. Invariably, it's really hard to stay very big. Yeah. Eating food like that. Cause it just, it's just way more filling. Like you talked about berries before, you know, take like 500 grams of like frozen berries out of the fridge and throw that into a big old bowl of fat free yogurt. It's only like 600 calories, 650 calories. You're going to want to die by the time you're done eating that. Yeah, or like, good you know, luck getting through it. Sit down to a dozen apples. Tell me how far you get. Right. Right. It's just like, you know, so I mean, you don't have to eat clean, let's just say, to lose weight. And they're doing studies. There's like the Twinkie study, the famous study that everyone quotes where a professor on food science in the Midwest lost a whole bunch of weight just eating like ho-hos. Fact of the matter is you can just have whey protein powder to get in your protein and just have Twinkies and look like you're in incredible shape. And actually, if you lose a lot of fat, you'll actually be healthier, but you'll be so damn hungry. So for the most part, it's teaching people to pick more filling foods on average, get them comfortable with that, get that habituated. And if you can do that successfully and get people moved to like, you know, 50, 60, 70% of their diet, whole foods and stop drinking calories, the weight usually tends to just start coming off of its own accord. Yeah. 
so in my head, I have all these versions of people and, and I was in the group that was just as big as you can get. I was, I, I don't know that people get much bigger than I was at my biggest. And, you know, there are, of course, there's somebody who did and a handful of people that did, but, um, but then there's like the guys who just have 20 pounds and it's like a very stubborn 20 pounds. And like, I don't begrudge them that that's a, a, like an, not a happy place to be those 20 pounds that you've tried over and over to get off. And I think about like the, the drugs, the semiglutide and trisepatide and, yeah. and stuff like that. And I think there is like, it does seem magical to me, you know, that, that, that you could have, we could be in a day and age. And, you know, this was something I wished for as a kid. Like if this had, uh, if this had popped up five years ago, I would for sure be on it a million percent. Yeah. I would be on it. Um, but I think I'm also of the, of the state where, Everything you just said is what I found to be true also making those changes. And I feel like if I started taking something like that today, I would almost gravitate towards eating, introducing back in those bad foods. So like, I don't know, it's a, it's a slippery slope, like, because I, I find sitting down to a bowl of apples to be an impossible task to get through or a head of celery. I can't, yeah. I can't beat a head of celery. I can beat when I'm competing. Celery. I turn hard to cabbage, right? Yeah. Lots of shredded raw cabbage in a bowl, man, that pumps the brake hard. Like <laughs> throw a little through. lemon on there. You'll break your jaw before you get full. Like it's yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's it. That's the game. Um, yeah. but, but it, it is, it's not fun. Right. Like, so this is like, for some people, they just don't have a very big appetite. I have a huge appetite. Every time I get really lean for a show or even maintain, just maintaining weight, even when I'm putting on size, I'm hungry all the time. Like it kind of never goes away. You know, um, I, I, if I don't watch it, I'll be obese and I'll always have to watch it. You know, so it's tantalizing the idea. It's like, ooh, what if we were to combine my discipline with not having to be hungry? Right. Right. Yeah. Um, so I don't really know where to go with that right because i can also get off on saying well you should just be disciplined like me and make it happen and you should right. just be like ethan and finally have a breakthrough and you know rehabituate everything and make your entire life this thing where you you finally put the pieces together that work for you but it just doesn't happen for most people i don't th it and doesn't happen no and and like I, if, I, how can i tell them you shouldn't have help or, but, but but to your point for the guy who's just trying to lose 20 pounds um, hire me. Uh, right. <laughs> I'm cheaper than I'm cheaper than semaglutide long term. Um, yeah, at all. but yeah, <laughs> I I I have almost like my own kind of study group that I that I observe because I've been dieting forever and and I was a, a member of this study group for a long time as like and and I don't want to out anybody but it's my wife and her friends who I don't want to out anybody but this is exactly who this it is. is who it is. Um, <laughs> And, you know, we've done every, every single fad diet. There's no fad diet that came along in the last 20 years that we didn't try at one point or another. And, and then I got this like, oh, hey, I'm not gaining the weight back. And here's what I'm doing. And hey, a year has gone by and I haven't gained the weight back. And I'm, I'm not miserable and life is fine. Life is good. And here it is. And for some of this group, it's like, no, I'm still going to go do the insanely low calorie, almost entirely processed food diet. Um, and, and like, so, so again, and these are sane, rational, very, uh, industrious people. Yeah. And I, and I, and, and I got to the point where I was just like, okay, well, I got to tell you, if you're going to go and do that insane diet, you could probably do it a little less painfully if you took one of these peptides also yeah you know yeah. if and that's I, what you're gonna do okay and also it's it's hard for me to criticize anyone for their choices right you know given you know what i was doing in my 20s banging around drinking doing drugs um and also just you know being a competitor the way that i compete 
you know, we're in the all drug Olympics, man. Like you bet your bottom dollar that trisipatide, semeglutide, everyone I'm going to go up against a couple years from now when I step back on stage is going to have had a much easier time getting down to 4% than they did last year. <laughs> I guarantee you that. And I'll be the one jerk who decided to just do it the good old fashioned way and lose sleep. Um, so, I, and, and we do it purely because we're psychotic and it's about winning a bodybuilding show. I mean, it's not even about health or just losing 20 pounds to, for whatever. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's hard for me to tell someone don't do that. Yeah. You know, no, or that too. you're you're wrong or you're immoral and you're you're taking somebody else's seat. Um, but at the same time, I do understand that if you are just doing it so you can keep eating junk food, if you run out of your supply, you are fucked. Like that's that's the problem. Like you are fucked. You are yeah. fucked. And I know this because I had a client who was in the Middle East and he was taking some some everyone says semaglutide, semaglutide, oh, yeah. right. And basically, you know, all I could do was try to get sufficient protein. And he was a very heavy guy. And we lost about 40 pounds when he was here in New York. And I kept consulting with him when he moved overseas. And he, he got on this drug. And he stopped eating all the food that I recommended for him. And he just started saying, I'll just have protein shakes during the week because I'm not hungry. And on the weekend, I'll binge as hard as I want. But I can't binge that hard. He'd be like, Ian, you'd be so proud of me. I only ate half a tray of Cinnabons. And I was like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> like, I was like, dude, this is, I, I swear to God, man, it's cool right now and you're losing some weight, but we really need to be focusing on these habits because God forbid you run out of this stuff. You, you're, you're actually like trying harder to have a worse diet. Like you're literally starving all week because you can and just feeding yourself amino acids and then you're just eating cupcakes and stuff on the weekend. And yeah, you're losing weight. Man, this is like, this is a heartbreak. And I know that's not everybody. Everyone's going to have a different relationship. This is this one person. This is a pure anecdote. Um, but I was just like, you know, and one time he did run out. And he gained 20 pounds in a month. And yeah. I was like, dude, can we please just try to eat some regular food while you're doing this? And I was like, because this is the greatest thing ever. You've got this thing where you can't binge which is a problem for you. You're not that hungry during the week. We can actually build habits now that you can keep in like a struggle-free environment. And, and I think that if, if most people use it that way, because this is the big problem, right? All that yo-yo dieting, loving junk food. If you're not as hungry all the time and you're not able to totally binge out because it just physically it stops you. When people get sick, people get, you know, want to vomit you can actually spend a couple of years working with a therapist, working with a nutritionist, putting together a program that works for you for healthier eating without all that crap going on in your head. I was like, yeah. that is actually pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and to your point, can... how you talked about like trying to increase the, the more kind of um, nutritious foods right the maybe less palatable because they are an apple to me is not as palatable as a big mac but an apple it isn't to anyone right yeah <laughs> so i i mean i i firmly believe if i at 500 pounds had just switched out some foods like that it would have had a profound effect i really i really do believe that um that could have gotten me here much quicker, right? Rather than just going like, well, bread is the enemy. If I just don't eat bread, all, I don't have to think about anything else, right? And so if I started right. to increase these, you know, I don't like to moralize them either, but these better foods and better is just for the path that I'm on, right? If some things are better for me today than others. Um, that's what I tell clients. These foods aren't good or bad, but they're more useful for what you want. Right. Right. And, yeah. and I, I do think we are presented with kind of a, a wonderful opportunity where if, if people are going to use these things and make those changes, then there's no fear because once you come off your body, you'll, you'll have this new habit of like, I choose a salad and reduce my dressing by a three quarters you know what i mean and don't get it covered in cheese and fried chicken 
I have a buddy who yeah. eats, uh, who's like, no, I'm very healthy. I eat one salad a day. And you go and you look at the salad and it's covered in fried chicken. Fried it's chicken. salad. It sounds great. <laughs> you know, and like. Uh, Where's the gravy? <laughs> cornmeal croutons yeah. and, you know, lots of cheese. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. that's a couple thousand calories in that salad. That that At least. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's like an entire day of eating when I'm on a diet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. um but I like I like what you're doing. I like seeing you in the gym. I'm always happy to see you, and I'm I'm glad you're out there fighting the fight, man. Trying to, and it's actually um, cool that we have outlets like this. So thank you for having me on. Um, one of the things that's really difficult is that teaching this kind of stuff doesn't it doesn't equate to like a lot of quick sales, and it's a hard sell. Yeah, selling forever is tough. And the more trainers, the more doctors, the more people like you we have out there talking about more responsible ways of losing weight, keeping it off, being good to yourself. Um, hopefully someday it'll continue to just slowly punch through all that other sort of get rich quick dieting and marketing noise because there's there's so much more of it. Yeah. And it, it's hard to punch through. And it's not a message that most people want to hear. I have a, a client right now. She just started working with us. And, you know, she's only, only down 20 pounds, you know, and she's about five foot and she was, you know, a little over 230 when we started and she wants to get down in the fullness of time to about 140, 150. And she's, oh God, we're just going so slowly, you know? And I said, yeah, and it's going to stay slow. I said, but how do you feel? She's like, oh, this is so much better than every other time I tried to diet. Like I'm not exhausted all the time. I, I'm just, I can think, you know, I'm not craving crazy foods all the time. She just sent me a message yesterday. She said I had this bag of candy and I just finished it. It took me over a month to finish it because I would just have one or two occasionally when I wanted them and I put it down. So that was a revelation for me. I would normally just eat the entire bag. Um, so, you know, if we can get people in line with, I would say the, uh, not get rich quickly, but, become strongly middle-class slowly right. <laughs> mentality, we will have a lot more success, but it's just like sort of anything else that you want to do well in life, um, build a business, get in shape, anything that's worth anything seems to take some real time and effort. And it's not something that's like built overnight. And it's usually effort that's sort of doped out over time consistently. And I think that this is what that encourages. Yeah, I no, I do too. It it is it is a bizarre thing, you know. You got a book like Rich Dad Poor Dad out there, and I think in the dieting space, there's a there's a hundred thousand books that are the antithesis of Rich Dad Poor Dad that are saying like, "I'll get you a million dollars tomorrow," you know. Right. And it's hard to sell somebody on no, Rich Dad Poor Dad talks a lot about personal responsibility and like a long runway to building something that with a big foundation, a million dollars tomorrow, it's impossible that there's a big foundation. It's, it's like, I bought that too for many years because like, I want to do as little as possible to make this change. It just doesn't, it's just not lasting. And I've not seen anybody that's lasted. I've not seen a single person who was like, I lost all my weight in three months and I kept it off. And I've never thought about it again. And I've made no other adjustments to my life. I haven't met that person. Those are some real outliers. And actually, one of my favorite quotes uh, to that end was, you know, if someone hands you a million dollars right now, you better become a millionaire quickly. So you get to keep the money. Right. Right. <laughs> you, you, it still requires work. Yeah. Like yeah. you think about the stats of. I think it's like 99% of the people who win the lottery for mega bucks, hundreds of millions of dollars. They're broke in a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So let's stop looking to get rich quickly. Let's all work hard at getting middle class eventually and, and getting to keep our houses and not getting foreclosed on. <laughs> That's the goal. That's, That's the, the goal. forever goal. That's Ian, the forever thank goal. You. Thank you, Ethan. It's been a real pleasure. And I can't wait to see you again at the gym. Yes, sir.